Hi, and welcome to the defence session uh, of the Conservative Party conference. I'm delighted today to be joined by my excellent ministerial team who have been working together throughout all this COVID crisis. Uh, I'd like to introduce them to you if you are unaware, but they've been working incredibly hard in making sure that our country is safe but at the same time we're supporting the rest of the government. At the far end is James Heapy, the Minister of the Armed Forces, who deals with operations and very much is at the coal face of what our forces do day to day. Baroness Goldie, who deals with uh, inclusion, deals with ceremonial and also deals with the very important position of the Union uh, and how uh, defence is an important gel to the United Kingdom. Uh, closest to me uh, is Jeremy Quinn, who is our Defence Procurement Minister. He's the man who has to keep a, a good eye on the £18 billion pounds a year we spend on equipment, making sure that uh, we try and stay in our budgets and indeed give our forces the equipment we need. Uh, and down uh, in Cornwall uh, is uh, Johnny Mercer, our Minister for Defence uh, People and Veterans, whose job is really to, to help support both our serving men and women uh, and indeed all those people that have served our country uh, and left to do other things uh, in the world or indeed uh, in business and at home. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the session and I look forward to uh, chatting really with my colleagues about what we've done over the last few months and what the future holds for us. Defence has been incredibly busy over this period, not only supporting uh, our men and women uh, of the armed forces, but also supporting the whole of government in tackling this COVID crisis. And, you know, I've been incredibly proud as the leader of this department to see what defence can do at a time of national crisis and a national emergency. And, you know, many of you will have seen right through the country from, from the local authorities all the way up to great departments of state like the Home Office or the Department of Health, our men and women helping with logistics, helping with uh, command and control and indeed helping with testing often in a car park near you bringing the services to our population to make sure that we get through this together. So we've all been really busy. Uh, the ministers know the detail uh, and every day have to manage some of these issues. So I'm going to first of all go to James Heapy, our Minister of the Armed Forces, and ask him how he's felt uh, it's gone and, and what his, he's learnt from how our men and women have been performing uh, in this crisis. Well, Ben, it's been an amazing year and I join you in paying tribute to the extraordinary men and women of our armed forces for all that they've done in responding to COVID. Um, you know, people will have seen them administering tests, they will have seen them driving PPE around the country for our NHS, they will have seen them helping their local authorities, but actually we've also had brilliant reservists who have brought their skill sets from the civilian world where they work in e-commerce and they've brought those skills to bear on designing new distribution mechanisms for the NHS which will hopefully last way beyond Covid and has really helped to underline to the rest of government and to the country at large just how fantastic our people are and the ingenuity that they bring to any task that we set them. And although I'm the Minister of the Armed Forces, I've also been keeping an eye on what our civilian staff have been doing. And people like our scientists in the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories have been doing amazing work developing new tests and, uh, and, and, and extraordinary things to help the NHS test the seals around masks that our intensive care clinicians have needed. So from civilians in the back office all the way through to soldiers, sailors, airmen out on the front line, it has been the whole of defence answering the nation's call in response to COVID. But that's not all. Right back at the beginning of the year, they were helping with uh, reacting to the floods in the north of England. Our people have still been deployed in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Mali. Our Royal Navy ships have been in every, no every ocean uh, of the world projecting British influence and protecting our interests. And our Air Force have been flying missions in the Baltic, they have been flying missions over Syria and Iraq, they have been hugely busy with business as usual. And then there's those that are at home, at readiness to respond for whatever might come. They too have had to maintain that commitment despite all of the turmoil that we've had in our family lives, they've had to know that they remain at very high readiness to answer whatever call that we make of them. And then finally, because we've been marking the incredible achievement of our undersea nuclear deterrent uh, over the last 50 years or so, worth mentioning that they just carry on doing what they do under the oceans, hidden from sight, never really spoken about. 
So from that, the most strategic of our capabilities, all the way through to people in the overseas territories helping there, or doing testing in the local ASDA car park. It's been an amazing year for our armed forces, and we owe them a great deal. Great. And can you tell me, James, about uh, what you think are the qualities that military operations brought to our COVID response across the whole of government? Well, I think our people just have a way of problem solving that is imaginative, it is confident, they are used to dealing with complexity. Normally that complexity is bombs and bullets and rockets firing all over the place and having to have the courage to devise and execute a plan in amongst all of that chaos. But actually give them a problem like this, a sort of a problem where they need to aid the civil authorities. Although the challenge, the threat is so different, the fundamental skill sets are exactly the same. And I think that's what's so heartening when you sit in our seats and you and the prime minister calls you up or we hear that there's a requirement from our colleagues elsewhere in government. And what might seem like the most enormous task, you hand it over to a soldier, sailor or airman and they say, don't worry, sir, we've got this. And they come back a day later and they have. It's an amazing organisation to be a part of. And what I think is even more extraordinary is that we know, history has shown us, that in these times of global crisis, insecurity, instability often follows. And so it's not that we can now sit back and say, job well done, defence has done a great job during COVID. Actually, we are now looking forward to a very, very busy period, I suspect, where we'll have to respond to all sorts of challenges around the globe in the wake of this pandemic. But our people are training, they are ready, and they're up for it. And what do you think the next steps are? I mean, winter, autumn, the world more unstable post-COVID. What do you think, uh, what are you preparing for and, and what are the next steps? Well, well, just right now, we know that there is rain and snow and ice coming over a normal winter. We know that there is uh, the pandemic on the rise again, all of which we have to be ready for. We're clearly ready for any eventuality when it comes to Brexit. And we are looking at where around the world is becoming interesting. And almost every day in the news, there are new countries that are appearing on our radar that start to think, well, hang about, we might need to be ready to respond there. And next year, the really big look forward to is the first sailing of our carrier strike group. And that is a really exciting thing. And what better way to respond to an uncertain world post-COVID than such a demonstration of British hard power sailing around the globe sticking up for our interests and helping to reassure our friends. I think that's great. And I think we are definitely the resilience department. We're the department that brings resilience to, the, to, to our rest of the government and our society. And I think you, know, you and leading them in the operations has, has really helped deliver. And I think we, we owe a huge debt to them all. Thank you, James. The MOD is truly the department for resilience, providing resilience for both local government and national government and also throughout society. And, Talking about resilience and resilience in our armed forces, what about resilience in business and industry that is so important to underpinning defence efforts around the world and at home? Jeremy. Well, I think resilience is the word. Uh, James spoke of the extraordinary men and women of our armed forces, but backing them up have been extraordinary scenes also in our industrial suppliers. There are thousands of British companies that we rely upon to supply our armed forces, and they've really stepped up to the mark this year. There's been a real Team UK approach around defence, and we've been deeply impressed by how they have assisted and supported their friends and their comrades on the front line. It's a heavy responsibility, but they've kept our planes in the air, they've kept our soldiers supplied, they've kept the submarines on which we rely to maintain the continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent that's helped keep the peace for 60 years. They've kept those submarines being produced in a way that is safe and which has delivered on their targets and they continue to support the key critical tasks of defence. As I said, that's a, a heavy responsibility on them, uh, but it's also a heavy responsibility on all of us as a, as a team. There are 119,000 people who work directly in defence and tens of thousands more in the broader supply chain. I, I'm pleased to say that we have nearly 20% of all our UK spend now going to SMEs. So we have people right the way across our country producing essential tasks, essential equipment to keep our armed forces at the peak of professionalism and able to undertake their tasks, which they do so brilliantly, as James was describing. But when I say across the, if I may, if I, I know Annabelle will touch on this later, but when I say across the whole of the UK, it is the whole of the UK, and our contracts reach out to every part 
of our union. We have brilliant ships being produced on the Clyde. This will be the first time in a generation that we're going to be producing two classes of frigates in this country. Uh, we have armour vehicles being produced in Wales, satellites in Northern Ireland, uh, aircraft in England. Right the way across the UK, there is delivery happening day in, day out for our defence forces. Uh, we've been truly proud of what they've done. And I'm very proud to be able to support them in my visits abroad, as I know you do uh, the same, Ben. We have some great kit being made in this country. We've got some great allies, and we wish to support them. I've also seen how proud they are of what they deliver to our armed forces. Again, James referred to our wonderful aircraft carriers. Uh, earlier this year, before COVID, I was able to visit Queen Elizabeth with uh, many of, the, uh, of, of those people from industry who made that happen, and hundreds of apprentices. They were all enormously proud of what they delivered, quite rightly so, because that's industry delivering on jobs, delivering on the critical innovation that we need to keep our country going forward, to provide the research and development that gives us the cutting edge, that delivers for our union, and above all, provides that platform for our extraordinary men and women to uh, act for global Britain on that global stage. And how have you found business? Have they been uh, receptive to our demands? Have they been supportive? How, how have they worked with us to make sure it carries on? Uh, throughout, I'm delighted to say we've had that level of support, not only from business, but right down to the factory floor. People have been determined and committed to support their essential defence outputs. There's been a huge battle going on in the home front, but not only to support that, but to keep us safe and to support our interests around the world, there is a task to be done. And all aspects of business have really risen to that challenge. We've been really pleased by that Team UK approach. Good. And have you been engaged in planning the next round of equipment, the new generation of equipment for our armed forces? Absolutely. And their innovation is key. So James referred to DSTL, the brilliant people we have all across defence and the civil service and DSTL working with us in industry and in the armed forces themselves, coming up with the new ideas, with the innovation, with the technology that we need to remain at that cutting edge. That delivers for our, our defence people. It delivers for our tasking around the world, but it also delivers for the country more broadly. We need to ensure that we are at that cutting edge. There's a throughput right the way across industry, and that's what we're delivering. And what, of all these last few months, where we've all worked differently and it's all been, you know, sometimes deserted in, in departments and on the, you know, outside, what is the one thing that's stuck in your mind about what you've seen and witnessed through the MOD and, and working uh, to get through this crisis? It's been teamwork and a can-do attitude. Uh, seeing how our, uh, our colleagues in uniform and across the civil service have risen to that challenge and delivered has been truly impressive. And I've been delighted to see that carry over into our industrial partners as well. People have known that we have a challenge as a country. They've known what that has meant. They've risen to that challenge and they have delivered. That's great. And if James is keeping the operations going. You keep the wheels turning of the equipment and the kit that we need to do the job. And, and it's been great, Jeremy, you helping get the British industry delivering, and, and I, I'm pleased. But all of that would not be possible if it wasn't for people. And the Minister for Defence Personnel and Veterans, Johnny Mercer, uh, obviously has been there at the front, keeping people going, motivating them, dealing with the fallout in veterans where you know, they are living out in the community and having to live with COVID. And I think that's why, Johnny, I'd like to be interested in your views of, of what you've seen with people and, and how you think both the serving men and women of the armed forces and indeed the veterans have coped. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's been an extraordinary year, really. I mean, uh, there's two distinct uh, parts to what I do in this department and in the cabinet office. And in this department, I very much focus on service people and they've very much been at the forefront, as you've heard already, uh, of pretty much every aspect to uh, the COVID response. So you've had, uh, you've had people, as we've heard, uh, working on the front line, delivering PPE, running testing stations, but that, then that all the way through that, that sort of thread, there's been veterans in the care pathway, if you like, right through to veterans who volunteered in their hundreds to come forward and work for great companies like Rubicon and charities like that, um, who've really sort of stepped up in a time of uh, national endeavor to, to meet the challenge. But look, in, in terms of policy, we, we haven't really sat still during this period. I was worried that COVID was gonna sort of dominate the bandwidth, but the reality is you've seen a very significant but irreversible strategic shift 
uh, under this uh, Prime Minister and under you, Ben, towards looking after our people. Um, you've seen that through a series of uh, policies, so you, you could class a sort of tactical success. Um, things like uh, the childcare policy, which is being uh, rolled out across Catterick, across Plymouth, um, and in High Wycombe at the moment, um, right through to things like uh, veterans rail cards, uh, through to the money that's gone into housing. There's been a very deliberate shift under this administration towards looking after our people. So we're finally getting to the stage, which is you know, why I became a member of parliament in, in the first place, which was to try and close the gap between what we say and how it actually feels to be a serviceman uh, in all women in this country. We've got some, uh, some brilliant uh, servicemen and women. You know, for a long time, I think we all feel that uh, they probably deserved uh, a little bit better than they've got. But I, I do feel over, you know, over the last 12 months in particular, we've had a, a real shift towards uh, what we're doing for them. In the veteran space, um, again, a lot is changing. Um, this is, we established the Office for Veterans Affairs. The first time the UK government has actually altered the structure of government, if you like, to make sure that somebody is taking responsibility for, not delivering, but taking responsibility for this nation's debt to those who serve. And again, we've had some really quick and good um, tactical successes. And the challenge now is to turn that into a really strategic success around what does it feel like to be a veteran in the UK in 2020. I'm clear that we can introduce things like a guaranteed interview programme in the civil service. We can introduce national insurance holidays for employers. We can do the uh, we, we can do the rail card as discussed, um, but actually we, need, we really need to answer that question. What does it feel like to be a veteran? And that goes across the whole gamut of employment, looking after people medically, um, making sure they understand a very clear pathway for things like mental health, which we know is a, is a growing challenge in our community. So um, look, it's been a really good year, um, but I'm clear we need to, we need to build on this year. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the most seminal work actually was around the uh, overseas operations service personnel and veterans bill which is really you know people wonder I think sometimes when they go and vote what they're actually going to get for their vote um, you wouldn't have found a prime minister with the courage in the last 40 years to actually try and correct this generational injustice of veterans who serve this country being subject to repeated vexatious uh, allegations and investigations often being drag through inquests and so on into old age. Actually, this Prime Minister came in and said he was going to do something about it. But unlike all the, all the rest of them, he actually did something. And it's something you can be really proud of, um, as a, we can be really proud of as a, as a Conservative Party, that actually we promised something difficult um, and we've actually had the minerals to step up uh, and deliver it. And it makes me very proud to be part of your team, Ben, and proud to be part of the Conservative Party. Well, that's great, Johnny. And I, and I know how passionate you are about the men and women of our armed forces and I think you know there's something's quite unique about our ministerial team there are four regular soldiers serving as ministers uh, you know if you include Leo Doherty who is our whip uh, he he too is a regular soldier that's almost unprecedented and I think what it does give is a, a unique perspective of what it's like you know I'm older than you Johnny and therefore uh, my time was Northern Ireland and everything else uh, and you you can talk with strength alongside James about Afghanistan and Iraq and, and what that has meant and I think it's been uh, a joy that as a team we work on that together and I I know that the men and women are at the heart of all we do you know we don't get the operations that James is uh, helping to run without the people we don't get the equipment and the energy and the logistics that we need delivered without the men and women uh, and we don't get them into the armed forces and staying in if we don't look after the terms and conditions and so what I'd be interested Johnny is you know, through this campaign, through this whole sort of COVID campaign where we've been dealing with it, what, what sticks out in your mind about the men and women that you've worked with, uh, you know, on the front line and, and, and the veterans community as well? What have they been asking you or reaching out about? So what really struck me was, um, was the willingness, really, of, of veterans to get stuck in, particularly in the early days when there was, a, I think, a fair degree of uh, nervousness around what COVID was and the implications of it and so on. Um, certainly the sort of volunteering in numbers made me very proud. But what particularly stuck in my mind was something I got as a constituency MP, actually. I had a letter from, uh, uh, from a, a lady, an elderly lady in Plymouth who had to go for a COVID test. She's, she was obviously, this was in the early days of COVID, she was very nervous about it, had no idea what was happening, 
very nervous with COVID and all that, but she turned up to a testing station in Plymouth. She was greeted by some Royal Marines in uniform who were friendly, polite, immediately set her at ease. Um, and it's just that kind of reassurance and professionalism that is, you can absolutely guarantee and rely on that's been lent on so heavily again by this country over the last 12 months um, and that we're so proud to represent. Excellent, Johnny. Well, look, I, I think, you know, we've come a long way through this process. The men and women of the armed forces have kept it going. Uh, but, of course, how the whole United Kingdom sticks together on this, how the men and women work together is, is obviously very important. And I think uh, Annabel Goldie, who is our, our minister in the Lords and my former boss from a long time ago in the Scottish Parliament, uh, she's very key to delivering many of those messaging and indeed policies that keep us together. And I, I wanted to ask Annabel that, you know, we often see in our media, we often see very much, you know, an English focused media if you're in England and a Scottish focused media if you're in Scotland. But as but the minister that really has to help us through in the union and make sure that our, our voice is heard in defence of the union, what's your experience been about how the military has landed COVID in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well as in England? Because you know, I think people should understand that we're in the fingertips of this country or this, these islands, uh, and that's really, really important to us. You use a good phrase then, fingertips. I think that's exactly what we are as a department across the UK. And I'm very clear that, as uh, Jeremy was explaining, you know, we are here to protect the citizens of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We're here to protect the national interests and security of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I think what COVID demonstrated very well was that within the United Kingdom, our defence personnel, our servicemen and women, they will go anywhere, whatever is necessary, whether it's to help with building the Florence Nightingale Hospitals or the Meath Jordan Hospital in Scotland, whether it was to help with the pop-up uh, testing stations, whether it was to help with delivering PPE. This was going on across the United Kingdom. And I think it was a very impressive demonstration of the uh, holistic approach of defence, of our relevance across the UK, and of how the individual member states of the UK all benefit um, from our presence. But I think the other aspect of this United Kingdom support is that, and I didn't realise this then until I became a Minister in Defence, I've seen it firsthand how, for example, we recruit our servicemen and women from all across the UK. We have a family of service personnel from all our different uh, member nations within the UK. But also, in having that recruitment across the UK, they then serve throughout the UK. And that's another illustration of the, the reach of our UK defence capability. But a very important part of this, and again, Jeremy was talking about this, I have seen the tremendous impact that our industrial partners who exist to provide us with the equipment with the ships, with the you know, with the um, the artillery, with the equipment that we need, I have seen how that absolutely generates not just economic activity throughout the United Kingdom, which is vitally important, but you know, it's a unique way of providing social cohesion. I've seen it firsthand, for example, in an industrial partner in Scotland, where a father and a son are working in that company, doing specialised work. They know very well that what they are doing is serving the ends of United Kingdom defence. They know very well that in doing that, they are helping to keep the UK safe. They are helping with our global influence abroad. And I think that's a tremendously important part of the defence family influence um, throughout the UK. And I, I think, to be honest, in a way, it seems to me that uniquely amongst government departments, I mean, we are the cement in the union bricks. Wherever you go throughout the UK, you will find evidence of our defence presence and our defence support, and it's a very positive, you know, development. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, our collective endeavour is the Union and the United Kingdom, and our history is littered with that collective endeavour, standing together to fight fascism in the Second World War, standing together to fight Napoleon uh, and the threats to Europe all, all those centuries ago, and, and standing together today to make sure that we protect all our shores. You know, the British Isles are protected by the United Kingdom uh, Navy to protect from Russia, who can very often threaten our airspace and others. And, and, and I think, what, 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 what are we going to do to make sure that not only do we reflect 
all geographic parts of the United Kingdom, but we reflect all the different types of people in the United Kingdom. Whether you're gay or straight, or whether you're a man or woman, you know, whether you're from a BME background or not, how are we going to do more recruitment of these people to make sure we're a more balanced force, so we reflect society uh, in the same way other parts of business and, and government do? It's a vitally important question, Ben, and it's an area of work within my portfolio that I'm both proud and absolutely delighted to be given responsibility for. You're absolutely correct. We have heard about the talent we have in defence within our armed forces, across our civilian population. And I am very clear that underpinning that is diversity. Because if we want the best talent, we're only going to get it if we're diverse. And if we want to attract that talent, we're only going to get it if we're inclusive. Otherwise, people won't want to come. And the good talent we've got, if we're not inclusive, won't want to stay. So to me, diversity and inclusion are absolutely pivotal to the continued successful operation of our manpower and women power capability within defence. And I've seen it firsthand, to be honest, a wind of change blowing. I don't think we've always got this right then, be utterly frank about that. But I have seen within the last eight to nine months an absolute sea change in how we're approaching diversity and inclusion within the department. <clears throat> the leaders coming from the top, from our permanent secretary, from our chief of defence staff, they are setting that lead. They are ensuring that people feel supported, that people feel welcome, that judgments are not made about people because of background, whatever that may be. They're ensuring that within the department we are educating to change culture, to change attitudes. We're ensuring that we're giving line managers confidence to identify something that may be wrong and unacceptable and to call it out and to deal with it. And I know the Chief of Defence Staff has been very clear that within the armed forces um, there is an absolute command going right down the chain of command to say we have to recognise and respect the different backgrounds of all our people. We all join up in the common cause of serving the country and protecting our people, protecting our security. And we must um, reciprocate that with respect, with support. So, for example, um, we are simplifying the complaints procedure. If people have reason to be concerned and make a complaint, there's been frustration at the delay and the complexity of the process. We're trying to cut through that to make it a lot more straightforward. We've introduced, with very recent effect from the start of September, an anti-bullying helpline 24-7. Fantastic innovation, absolutely delighted about that. We have to make sure that all our people, whether in the armed forces, whether within our civilian population, that they feel there's somewhere they can go, there's someone they can talk to, they're not alone, and that if they have a problem, we want to know about it, and we want to help them to resolve it, and we want to assist them in, in determining that that solution gives them a positive future and more confidence in their presence within our defence family. But I think the other really important thing is that we also want to make sure that we provide that positive career progression. And I know within the armed forces, the Chief of Defence Staff is very clear about sending that message, about looking at recruitment, about broadening the base of how we interview, what is it we need to do to make people from different backgrounds feel welcome, feel included, feel they have a place with us. And the other thing that's, uh, I think, very important within the civilian population is we're certainly investing in training for line managers to ensure that they are aware of what can arise and they have to deal with it. They can't sit back and think that's someone else's problem. They have to deal with it. And what I've seen is a renewed sense of confidence, I think, across the fence about a willingness because of this leadership from the top to feel positive, to feel included and to feel confident about now expressing concerns, knowing that they will be dealt with in a sensible and sensitive fashion. So I think there's a terrific message coming out of MOD, Ben, on diversity and inclusion, and we shall be the stronger for that. Well, I think you know my ambition is that this department is one of the best departments to work in in uh, government, uh, and that we have a workforce, as you say, of all the talents. You know, just like the United Kingdom, we are better when we work together as a team 
uh, and you know differences don't matter what matters is our skills and our outputs and and that is where we are best it's the greatest privilege when you serve in the armed forces to realize that your job as a young officer is to gel together people of different backgrounds and different skills to get the best out of them and i think you know what what that means for me is leading this department is a privilege because not only do i get to work with a really great team of ministers and and we work as a team uh, but I also get to work with some amazing people across defence, whether they are the most junior private in the army uh, or a pilot in the RAF, whether they are the chief of defence staff, General Sir Nick Carter, or the reserve person who works in an NHS hospital for most of the time and then comes to help us in Mali uh, or elsewhere around the world. That is truly inspiring. And I know that many of my colleagues look at the MOD as, as a job they'd like to do one day. And I, I, I think you know, we all realise how lucky we are I'm lucky to have a team like the ministers you've met today uh, and you know please remember that the Conservative Party is the party that supports defence. Uh, as Johnny Mercer said the Prime Minister has supported his pledges, he's delivered on them in protecting our veterans. We've established a veterans agency, uh, we are delivering uh, on the manifesto commitments around childcare and investing in our armed forces and as we go forward in an even more uncertain and anxious world I'm confident that many of you will be able to sleep safely in your beds because of the work that the Ministry of Defence and the Armed Forces do day in, day out, to remember that the first duty of government is security.